Hey everyone, got a great show for you this week. It's a cross-pollination of sorts. I am talking with my friend Glenn Murphy on his podcast, Systema for Life. And Glenn is actually my instructor in Systema. But the conversation was so good on his podcast, I really wanted to share it with my audience, and he graciously agreed. Uh, so thank you, Glenn. Anyway, guys, this is a fantastic conversation about Systema and Original Strength. I hope you enjoy. Pull up a chair and buckle up. It's the Original Strength Podcast. Tim. Welcome to System of Life. Glenn, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's it's a pleasure, man. It was um, it was a great pleasure to get uh, get a message from you um, while I was out of the country at the time, um, asking about um, you know, getting together to train some Systema or experience Systema. I'd actually been following your stuff, um, for quite a long time, um, and and got come of the a uh, couple of the original uh, original strength books and like liked the like the uh, the 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 kind of approach that you had and like I discovered Systema quite a long time ago and original strength probably only about maybe six seven years ago something like that um how long have you been doing original strength is that interesting uh, since about 2010 actually 2010 oh, okay so I, I didn't discover it that far after you'd like done no it, so it, years. And, yeah. and really in 2010 it wasn't it wasn't original strength it was just me playing with the concepts of it so it okay. didn't really become a thing until maybe 2012. Yeah, when did the um, when did the book come out? Because I remember I got the ebook, like the I think it was an ebook anyway, right? That, yeah, yeah. So that one was that was about 2010. That was about 2010. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I feel like that's around maybe about 2012 around that area is probably when I picked it up and um, and I was I think I was interested because of the you know the emphasis on natural movement, which is one of the four pillars um, that we talk about in systemic training uh, a lot of the time, um, and this kind of regressive approach towards physical education that, that you don't just have to crunch out more you know um, more attempts to make your muscles bigger or even like kind of force yourself to become super flexible but this idea that you know by regressing to a form of movement that we all have and we all had as um as babies and then working away through those that you can kind of reset your body and build this kind of primal internal structure that's kind of your birthright and that we abandon through modern kind of everyday practices you know and that's that's completely in alignment with what we do in system i know you've done a lot more beyond that and um, hopefully you can tell us a little bit about the scope of what you've done and where it's gone as well um but just that one idea um that you know going back to the basics and even mikhail Ryabko, one of our absolute founders, you know, has said, if you really want to learn how to move, watch babies, watch how they start to move, watch how they develop moving, how they go from rolling to crawling, try and move with that much like connectedness and relaxation and, and you'll be on the right path, you know, which I thought was really fascinating. And then your um, original strength book really said the same thing to me. And even though it was a fairly similar, uh, simple kind of sequence of events like Systema, it's like simple but not easy. Like the first time when you try and do a really good crawl, it's kind of, it doesn't look the way you think it's gonna look. You know, you have this kind of advanced idea of yourself in your head that's not quite translated through your joints when you try and, uh, try and hold balance and do it. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about how you how you got started with this um, whole idea? Yeah, um, so I was, uh, I was overzealous. Uh, I found out about kettlebells and um, I, I, I went to sleep dreaming about kettlebells. I'd wake up planning how I was going to train with them. Hmm. And I, I started to develop overuse injuries. Hmm. Uh, and, and instead of being smart I and, and taking a break and giving my body rest, I decided to learn corrective exercises hmm. so that I could um, fix myself. A CrossFit so, approach, like cross, I, thing of work, work out of the day, followed by foam rolling of the day and smash and, like, and then r rinse, lather, repeat. Right? So. But it's, it's weird, right? Like you, you never, you never, it, it takes you so long to catch on that. If I have to foam roll every day to fix a problem, am I really fixing the problem? You know? Mm. <laughs> yeah. So, or am I, am I maintaining the problem with my movement? Kind of thing? Or have I just found yeah. a really neat ritual that I like that's really not helping me? Um, yeah. So but yeah, so I would, uh, I had these overuse injuries and I learned how to do corrective exercises and I learned how to fix myself only I didn't. Right. So I would, I would try to fix something and then it seemed like something else would pop up and then I would try mm -hmm. to fix that. And it seemed like something else would pop up. Mm -hmm. And eventually I started to feel, um, just broken a little bit and, and there was nothing really wrong with me other than these nagging things. I just, I couldn't do what I wanted to do freely basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and so one night I was just sitting around the house and I asked God to show me how to train to be bulletproof because I, I didn't feel like Superman and that's, I wanted to. True. And, and within two weeks, I picked up a book on learning disorders in children and mm. um, God just connected the dots and I saw how beautiful 
our design is and that almost everything we need to be mm. strong and healthy is is inside of our our body already so so for you it was kind of almost like a calling right is it like there was a kind of a kind of a, a spiritual coming home aspect to it as well it wasn't just you know you were looking to optimize in a kind of tim ferris get everything right physical like hone yourself and hone your body sense you you were looking for something um a, a wider capacity and yeah and, and you felt like you know th through your search and through your faith you kind of found that well and because i mean i mean i'm sure there's always arrogance involved when we're on our own personal journey but like i i was resting on that i was a smart person i knew mm -hmm. like I, I i understood the corrective things i i was i was i was studying i was i was applying all the concepts but nothing was working mm -hmm. you know and i couldn't i couldn't fix myself so it, it was really to the point where well i don't know how to do this <laughs> mm. so so I, I went for i figured if anybody knows how the body's designed it would be god and if anybody could help me it would be somebody wiser than myself so it was okay. that was my hell mary desperation <laughs> you know okay. search for something that that i couldn't figure out so, so what took you from that question to the to the solution that you found there, there must have been like some stepping stones um, towards what, what you actually developed you would think so but it was actually quite <laughs> that was the, the miracle part of it is literally when i picked up that uh it was it, the book was called smart moves um from carla hannaford okay and and i'd already read it um but when i picked it up and i was just skimming through pages like sentences were jumping out at me and i it was amazing i knew that i knew that i knew before i even tried the movements that would become mm. original strength mm. i already i knew they would i knew they would already work like yeah. i was convinced before i even did them it was just a, a knowing that is so hard to explain like it's in the um, body i got things like a yeah yeah it was like everything within me resonated with it with this is it this is what you're looking for um mm. and i i didn't even know how powerful it really was only other than okay this is what i'm looking for but i did not know how far reaching and how powerful it could be for other people as well yeah um, you know because that wasn't what i was looking for i was just looking for sure. me <laughs> trying to fix yourself first right is it yeah. right right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that's it that's amazing that's yeah there's um it, it, there's a couple of things in there that, that are quite interesting for me it's like that how easy it is first of all just to get caught in that trap of i'm going to do this one thing and be really fanatical about it whether it's kettlebells or or even like hardcore calisthenics you know see people doing these like crazy bar stars routines and things like that you know i got into that a few years ago i was just embarrassed that i couldn't really do decent pull-ups i'm like i need to study the pull-up for a while you know we do a lot of push-ups in right. system but i'm like i need to be able to do a decent pull-up and there must be an imbalance caused here by not being able to do one and i studied them for a while and got to the point where i could do you know like 120 pull-ups or something like that and really got into it but it created horrible imbalances in my body and like tensions that i I'd constantly be having to undo and then when i went up north to toronto to train system out people would just punch me in the chest and it would go right through and just resonate in my lats and my shoulder blades and go oh, and i just couldn't absorb anything because it was i was too you know there was slabs of meat down my shoulder blades that just wouldn't move you know and right. it's um so it actually held me back and it and it made me regress in my training and i dialed that right back i was like okay that's what happens when you get fanatical about anything you know yes. it'll go that way so I, i've definitely suffered that myself and gone down the pathway of like if I, I can just fix this i'm so smart that you know i'm so well read and I'm, I'm so good at picking things up like i'm sure i can just read a bunch of stuff and figure out how to do this you know raid the barnes and noble you know self self <laughs> self development section and, and physical things or order a bunch of books off the internet um, yes. and figure this out for myself right but it, there is a strange there's a point sometimes when we have to recognize that humility right and be like i don't have all the answers and it's okay to say i don't know yeah. i just don't and then just throw it up to a higher power or the universe or depending on your faith and where you know what you believe mm -hmm. and and just just admit that you're not the font of all knowledge and it's and it might not be you know, just trying harder to read and outsmart everything might not be the way forward. And then sometimes when you do that, when you just admit you don't know, and you'd be like, throw it open and be like, help me out, God, or help me out, universe, or whatever you feel, it, the answer seems to fall into your lap, you know, and you, I've, I've experienced this sometimes during forced breaks in training as well, where I've had to spend a month away or something, as I recently did, um, because of a family bereavement. And, and I've come back thinking, oh, this is going to be horrible. I've got, you know, there's so much to catch up on. And, but what happened in the interim is like the dust settled and some form of kind of body knowledge just consolidated itself. And then I come back actually cleaner in my movement. Like as I'm trying to do less and I'm not trying to work through problems in my, of movement in my head and things seem to get easier in a sense, you know? So sometimes there's this sense that 
taking a step back, you know, just kind of dropping back in your own body and stopping this kind of in your head, I'm going to work this out. I have the control. I have the power and just relinquishing control and just being humble and saying, you know, what? I don't know. I, I, I'm, I don't know me. I don't know. And then sometimes it will come to you or somebody will come to you who helps you. That's the yeah. two things that I've experienced. Yeah. And it's, it is crazy. Like, and mm. even so like, if it is a training thing, like, well, there's, there's exercise science, there's uh, physical therapy, there's all these mm. modalities, like, well, surely there's a, there's a movement um, system that, or if I do certain movements and certain things like with weights or with bands or, or with foam rollers that with all the stuff that's out there, this is going to, that ha- the solution has to be there. Mm. But so who, so the wisdom of, and the, and the surprise of, no, the solution is just getting on the floor and moving like a child. Yeah. Like, it's, it's not all the science. It's not all the stuff that you read about, you, you know, or study about. It's, it's literally going back to the way you moved when you first came into the world. And yeah. that, that is crazy. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. And so also so brilliantly wonderful at the same time. Yeah, definitely. So how have you, I know you've acquired a couple of Systema books since, um, and maybe we can get into that first really quick, but how did you come across Systema? You told me a little bit about it when you came to my house and did a private and stuff like that. But um, how did you find us and what was the interest in and crossover? So a friend of mine who um, through YouTube, who would watch my videos and stuff, he, he would keep peppering me. Hey man, I really think you would like Systema. <laughs> and he, you know, and I would like, and, and all I knew about Systema was it was a Russian martial art. Hmm. Uh, and, and so in my mind, therefore I wasn't interested in it. And, but then every time he would like every, you know, every few months, I really think you would like Systema. Are you doing this? You're doing that. There's so many similarities. So just not to get you off, but you weren't interested primarily because it was a martial art and you don't yes, consider correct. yourself like a violent person or not because it was Russian. No, so. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. Well, I like, well, I, I don't know anything really about Russia or martial arts other than okay, I, yeah. I, I was like, well, like, I'm, I don't want to fight, you know, and I, you know, yeah. so and I definitely don't want to fight big Russians. I mean, that's no, no, not at all. <laughs> yes. so, yeah. and it's cold there. And that's not me. So, <laughs> um, but so it just didn't like in my mind, it just wasn't clicking. And, and then along the way, I met this, uh, I have a friend who, uh, another friend who's in his seventies who does Sistema hmm. and he, and he's been doing some, some of the OS programs and stuff. And he's like, this really reminds me. It resonates so well and fits so well with Sistema. Tim, I really think you should check out Sistema. <laughs> so, right. so you're getting so it just, lots of angles. It's, it, so, you know how sometimes um, the straw that breaks the camel's back, you, you get enough, you get enough straws yeah. and you get some weight. I think that sure. was the tipping point for me where I was like, hmm. you know what, I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look up Sistema and see what this is about. Um, uh, and so what I, was that like? Because sometimes when you go down the YouTube rabbit hole, I've, I've had people that have referred Systema to people and said, hey, you should check out Systema. It's great. And then they type it into Google and all manner of things can come up, right? So, so yeah. I was fortunate enough for them to both suggest some books that I should start with. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so so yeah. I, went, I, I went on their suggestion because I really didn't know anything. And I, I've, I, and again, if I look up Systema, I, I see people punching somebody in the gut or cold water dousing stuff or mm-hmm. all kinds of stuff. And I'm like, tanks, oh. Kalishnikovs, people waving their hands and flying yeah. around. It's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. it's buried. Yeah. So I was really kind of, you know, I was like, well, I'll check these books out. Um, mm. And that's, that's really what, what got me going was just the, Hey man, you should really check out system. So you, and so you got hold of Vladimir's book, let every breath. And yeah. I think one of um, Matt's Matt, books as well. Yeah. Yes. Um, um, every like as living system, I think is yeah. what it's called. Yeah. Matt Hill's got uh, so many great books. I always recommend those to people. He just has a lovely way of, um, I don't know, personalizing or making, making the training very, very straightforward. I like his my minimum effective dose approach. He's like, hey, right. man, don't, don't try and kill yourself with this stuff. Don't be a fanatic, you know, just get up in the morning, just live it, breathe it, do, do some simple things and, and get on with it. And on you go. So I love his approach. He's a lovely guy. If you ever talk to him, he, you know, he's a former um, British army um, paratroop captain. So, you know, he has all of that experience and all that kind of stuff, but he's just like the, the kindest, you know, um, least affected guy you know he's he's not trying to impress you ever at any point you know he's just quietly going about his business and he has that quiet solid strength that people really lean on you know and you can you can i think you can feel that through his books right when you read them well and it is an easy uh easy communication style and yeah so and his was the first book i read and that's what actually hooked me because I like, so in my mind, when you get an original strength, well, it becomes, it's your, it's your, it's your natural design of movement. So yep. you end up living that every day if you're living according to your design. Yeah. So 
so then when I read Living Systema, I was, it, and this is weird, Not I kind of told you this, but it was like, wait, did I write his, this book? He yeah. could have written my book. Yeah. Like, yeah. because the similarities were so, and then I was like, no wonder everybody's telling me to check out Systema because it's yeah. almost as if we're both talking about the exact same thing. We're just calling it a different name almost. Yeah, minus, exactly. the, minus the fighting stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, yeah. The natural movement is is a corner of Sistema, and there's a lot of other things. There's a lot of a philosophy attached to Sistema as well, which is, um, which is, which is either different or you know, addended compared to original strength and things. But what I think is what's really fascinating about that, you know, I'm a biologist by training, and um, in biology they have this phrase called convergent evolution. You know, and they talk about like, well, if birds can fly and like insects can fly and things like that, you know, um, flying must be useful in some way, right? And it's but but they're not necessarily related to each other, right? They were, right. you know, they evolved or were created or independently, right? Uh, kind of that way. Um, but they both arrived at the same solution, right? They both need to be able to do that. And same thing with some burrowing animals and you know other things like that. And so, at a fundamental level, when you see like people let's say in a tribe in New Guinea, you know, digging a hole and making a fire in a certain way. And then you see that also in, you know, Native American tribes in Canada or something like that, right? Um, and they're both doing it in a similar way. Either they share the same route, like once they were one people, right? And then they just spread out or they both kind of converged on just the perfect solution or a natural solution or the, the right way of doing things, right? There's, when you strip down all the artifice and you take off all the other extraneous things that might be leading you away from making a good fire, right? they both, they both come at that, that perfect solution. And I think some, that's kind of an interesting part, I think of the Venn diagram that overlaps yes. between original strength and system. It's like with the, there seems to be a, like a shared philosophical element in the sense of when you strip away all that's unnecessary and you get back to like the absolute fundamentals of what you need, right? Um, you need to be able to kind of, you know, hold this structure and these orientations. You need to be able to move your body as one piece, coordinate things, all that kind of stuff. And you, and you use simple motions rather than do 50 different things, targeting 50 different muscle groups with 50 different mobilizations. You know, you just, crawl or you just roll or you know and, and you do it very very mindfully and, and you know as smoothly as possible you know without as much over effort and tension as possible um and and you arrive then at like a powerful natural open structure and you have a foundation upon which you can build right and and in sistema once you have that foundation of natural movement you can fight with it you can swim with it right <laughs> you can yeah. just be a good husband who doesn't in, injure himself doing diy with it you know um which i try to as often as i can you know try and injure myself um or you can do whatever you want you know you can you can kind of use that so in a sense they're both kind of operating systems for creating natural movement right um now sistema is also an operating system for other things as well and i'll be interested to see you know how you've you, you know, you said that you originally devised original strength in a sense as a way of fixing yourself, but you are surprised at how it's grown. What's happened to it since, because it's no longer just a movement of, you know, pressing resets and trying to fix bodybuilders or crossfitters and just makes them fitter. There's a lot more that's come out of it. How have you seen it change uh, and what does it mean to you now? Oh, well, like, again, so it started out where it was just a, it was a hopefully a, a solution for myself. Um, hmm. And what ended up happening was, I was feeling like I knew I had found something so amazing that I just really wanted to start sharing it with people. Hmm. Um, and so then it became like, you know, so wrote some more books about it, but it started doing workshops um, and then started getting to get in front of like other curious people like uh, doctors, therapists would start, you know, coming to workshops, um, getting letters from other people or like they've had conditions for years that now they don't have anymore. Hmm. Um to even to so like ended up like going to Johns Hopkins Hospital and doing presentations there for their therapist staff and, and going mm -hmm. to uh, to the NFL, some NFL teams, some NBA teams <laughs> to do presentations. It was just crazy, awesome. crazy right. stuff, right? Kind and, of ballooned. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so and so ultimately now we have um uh, we have instructors kind of really almost everywhere, anywhere in the world. Uh, and we have uh, we have specific courses for for uh, strength and conditioning coaches, uh, for for physical therapists, for chiropractors. Like so, it just it's really grown though from from how it from that from that four to seven dollar PDF uh, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, book, which honestly everything anybody needs was was always in that little. Shh, don't tell PDF them that thing. they'll just go for they won't get the videos they won't do no, the training. Don't tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> 
but this that's it though it's like yeah, it's, yeah. It, but the, the thing is is though that everybody are they, everybody owns sure. that that information anyway because it's tucked away inside of the nervous system yeah yeah there's no yeah, there's no ip on on how you the human no. body moves right yeah, it's like yeah. yeah nobody owns movement yeah there was an interesting um there was an interesting uh case a couple of years ago um in which one of our guys who's a phenomenal mover uh Quan lee his name is he's in he's in the northwest of um united states he's up in i've seen uh, his videos Seattle. you've seen his videos yeah seen so he's a videos. phenomenal mover like to the extent that you're like okay not everybody can do this or maybe even should you know get to this place so his ability to kind of load his joints and move them through range and stuff like that but he developed that over many years of training and he had some training before systema and then developed it through and using the systema principles and and he's helped a lot of people get a lot stronger and a lot more flexible um and um, and to kind of improve, I think, their system of structure and practice and their ability to isolate and hold hold structure. Um, but there was an interesting, there was another guy um, called uh, Greg Mievich, I believe, who was in uh, Europe and, and he had kind of like his own system. Oh, wait, no, I think actually he moved over to uh, the States. Sorry, my bad. Um, but he had a system of like ground movement and rolling and things like that um, kind of derived from kind of either Slavic systems or things that he'd come up with, you know, like you, he, he just felt, oh, this, this makes perfect sense to me. And he devised a system of kind of crawling, rolling and, and, and working that looked similar to some of the joint rotation things that Quan was doing. And then there was this uproar, like, oh, you're stealing things from Quan. You've, you've nicked this movement, next movement. And, and he's like, wait, who owns movement again? You know, like, and, and you also see it in martial arts, you know, in that field, you see people watching MMA and somebody does like a weird kick and they're from a karate background or something. And they're like, oh, he did that. That's actually a Taekwondo kick. We have that in Taekwondo. And the guy's like, I've never done Taekwondo in my life. We just have, you don't own a kick. You know, so right. there's only so many ways that you can fling limbs at another person, right? And it's like, nobody, nobody owns those things, right? It's like maybe some people have branded them, right? And, they, and they've kind of, um, they've, uh, kind of uh, demonstrated them more often they've been associated with certain you know groups or you know schools or wherever it's going to be but but nobody owns good movement right it's just it's just a thing and, and i think you can come to it from different angles i think you can see yeah. dancers sometimes you know do contact improv you can see yogis who get into you know and they develop kind of flow movements between static poses and things like that and a lot of them from different places get to a similar place that we do right you get to this smooth capacity this understanding of the you know the um, primacy of the spine and and good posture and, and all those things and and just come sort of kind of mobile and powerful shoulders and hips you know that hold themselves um but a lot of them go seem to go around the houses a lot you know you have to go via a lot of different steps in order to get to that place you know mm -hmm. years of dance study years of yoga and things like that what i really like about original strength is that it doesn't it just kind of pairs everything down and sort of says hey, do these five six things reliably consistently um and it will build the foundation that you fundamentally need and then go where you want with it enjoy be a firefighter yeah. you know be a be a you know a, a combat athlete or all those tactical guys that does mud runs and tough mudders and things you know it's like whatever you're going to doing whatever you're doing with your body it cannot hurt to have like this bulletproof foundation to things right and that's that really appealed to me right away when i saw the book and it, and it was useful to me at a time in my systema training where i was absorbing a lot of different things and trying to including quanley's videos and twirling my wrists around and then i'm like oh man i did that a bit too much you know and stuff like that mm -hmm. so it's um it, it helped me kind of take a step back and be a little bit less fanatical so i thought it was um it was, it was a very good message keep it simple you know keep it simple and and honestly like when i get and then i gotta be smart with systema but when i dive into stuff mm -hmm. i go like i get really excited like the kettlebell yeah. thing um but it is nice though to, to always be able to check myself now and say tim just roll around on the floor rock back yeah. and forth and crawl yeah. around a little bit what more do you need <laughs> so yeah. it's like because it has totally changed my mindset for for how we're designed to move and and what we're designed to do to mm. stay healthy and strong like sure. uh, i the exercise to me now is like something i i have no interest in which is funny because mm. that's my you know my field sure um mm. but I, I i really don't care about it i because movement to me is the thing yeah have you, you ever heard of a guy called uh, max shank he's got yes he has that yeah so this was really interesting so i saw some of his stuff years ago and he had he used to have this system something like primal athleticism or something like that i think it was um and i think his idea was like let's use very few 
kind of weight bearing or or calisthenic movements to build a foundation for strength so that you can be an nfl athlete or you can be a gymnast or whatever you can do and, it, and he had some fairly simple stuff it was like you know let's do deadlifts for deadlifts and pull-ups or something alternating for a quarter of an hour and interspersed with mobility right for time not for repetitions mm -hmm. you just keep doing them and when you get tired you switch exercises you know you do whatever you're going to do uh, and then for the second 15 minutes you'll alternate um you know some form of squatting with some form of push-up type thing or you know maybe l sits or something like that and and i quite liked it and there's lots of things like, like gymnastic bodies and gold medal mm -hmm. bodies and things they've all got their own little systems in which there's like three to six elements you know things right. that they start with and then they'll build up towards more complex things um and some of these come from years of gymnastics education and some of them come from more recent people going together but what really interested me about him is that he was he used to advertise as like ripped and just like Bruh! and i'm you know you can become bulletproof in the sense that you're so strong you know you just be a big slab of muscle and it's really hard for you to injure your shoulder or do something like that you know if you if you get this strong and this powerful and that that was kind of his whole shtick and then i saw about a year ago that he he did another one um i think sorry i'd tell like the first one was called i think ultimate athleticism so his whole thing was like you want to be an ultimate athlete you have to build this super strong foundation and then the one that he did more recently was called primal athleticism and then when i watched it he'd lost about 30 pounds and he had a hippie beard and he's wearing like tie dye stuff and he's in his back garden instead of a gym with a bunch of dudes. And he's just like, hey, man, all you really need to do is like roll and like sing every day and like be with people. And you know, he's, he, like, he'd gone this whole journey of being like the, the best athleticism guy. And then somewhere along his journey, he was just like, no, man, all you really need to do is just roll around and make sure your joints are mobile and just breathe properly. And I'm like, oh, OK, there, there's another one, you know, like so I, see, I see this. Arc. <laughs> yeah, I see this arc in people getting really into this physical things and then at a certain point maybe injury drives it maybe it's constantly getting injured maybe it's like the constant psychological tension that comes with just maintaining that kind of like, i've got to be on form i'm a 90 percent performance athlete even if you know your job is a desk job and you're only doing crossfit for fun in inverted commas right people just get into that mindset and then and it, it's not working for them anymore you know what i mean it's like maybe when you're 20 or something or 30 and you're trying to meet chicks and impress them you know <laughs> maybe maybe that's the driver but maybe there's a certain time of life as well when that goes away or you're like maybe the kind of women i want aren't interested in that you know maybe they're, they're, they're looking at something beyond that like my capacity to calm down and not shout at them because i'm just beefed up all the time you know and things like that but something triggers people to go through this arc, even if they're really gung ho about it. And then they seem to arrive at the same results. It's like, no, just pare it all down, learn to breathe, learn to move properly, and you'll be happier and do that every day. And if you want, you know, a bit of weight training here or there, a bit of calisthenics, but like, don't be a, don't be a fanatic. And that, and that's literally the watchword that I passed down to us from Michael and Vladimir. They're like, everything's, you know, everything could be good. A little bit of boxing could be good, a bit of wrestling, a bit of weight training. Don't be a fanatic about anything, including Sistema, which I think is interesting. Like they warn people about that. Like, don't be fanatical about it. It's great. It's fast. You can get lost in it. Don't be a fanatic. You know, so it's um, so I think that's a really interesting message. Yeah, I think I think what happens is for some people like Max, myself, um, you get to the point where either either maturity sets in or hmm. <laughs> or like a, a weird form of wisdom where you realize, you know what, it feels good just to feel good. Yeah. And a lot of the things we do to, to create that mystique or that mystery of the body that we want, a lot of that doesn't feel good. And it ends up like me, I want to be Superman, but the kettlebells were like making me feel like anything but Superman. Yeah. Mm. But to me, those were the things that were supposed to make me feel like Superman. So I would keep, sure. keep mindlessly hitting my head against that wall where you, I think there is this natural evolution where you decide that not what's going to make you happy in life is being able to move pain-free being able yeah. to do the things you want to do with your family, you know, yeah. if you need to be useful and you're called upon to be able to act and respond, but you don't need to be a brick tank to do that. And if you are, you're probably going to be less useful because you can't move as fluidly and as, as, as well as you're designed to, or someone that's half your size can. Sure. So, you know, there's these, I think it's just this weird realization. And besides how many people do you see that beat their body up in their thirties and forties with weights and things like that, they are continually able to beat their body up with when they're in their 60s, 70s, 80s. Yeah. 
Yeah. And if they do, what is the quality of their movement and how yeah. and their life? Like usually it's defined by a couple of hip replacements and some elbow surgeries and stuff. You know, what I mean it's like that you become like the, the weakest link in the chain will go sooner or later, and then you become limited by that. And then right. ultimately those people stop training, you know, altogether. They're like, Oh, I used to train. You, you should see how fit I was in high school, or I was ripped when I was 40, you know, and then pff, it all just goes to flab and they feel terrible and they get, you know, knock-on diseases and CHD and right. like diabetes and all kinds of things. Whereas if they did less. <laughs> if they deliberately underachieved and just rolled and moved around a bit every day they'd probably enjoy their movement more they would do it more and they could do it more sustainably over time you know so. but i think i think that's the the unfortunate aspect of our society as far as how we push and glamorize certain types of exercise or the whole fitness industry in general mm. and because it, like as a child growing up well if you want to be like that you got to do these things Hmm. because you know you had these role models or like Schwarzenegger Sylvester sure. Stallone whatever you know yeah. well they lift weights they do all this stuff and they don't tell you all the other things they really do either but yeah. you you think there's this way you've got to go about being to be a guy to be a man to be attractive to whatever you think there's sure. these things you have to you have to do and maintain yeah. when all of that's a lie and smoke and mirrors anyway yeah this I used to think to be honest I used to think this was a problem that was um restricted to the fitness industry Right. I used to think this, yeah, this is a lie that fitness and perhaps like, you know, um, modeling and things like that, you know, and, and if people have talked about it a lot in relation to women and giving, you know, unrealistic examples and photoshopped, you know, right. uh, figures that are kind of all airbrushed out and every woman in every, every woman, every magazine has perfect skin and, you know, perfect curvature and all that kind of stuff. And it, and it's, it's done a lot of damage, especially to adolescent girls who aspire to that. And they're like, I can never be that. It's like, well, even the women that are in those photographs don't look like that when the photographs were taken, you know? And so it sets this kind of false, un unattainable expectation and builds a lot of anxiety and people never feel like they're, they can ever become who they want to be and that sort of stuff. And, and the same thing with men, like some people have that, I don't know, they call it kind of like, um, man, it's like the opposite of anorexia, like bigger dysmorphia. Rexia, I think they've nicknamed it. Yeah, dysmorphia. It's dysmorphia. It bigger rexia, like, I'm never yeah. big enough. You know, these weightlifters and bodybuilders, they're like, no, I'm, I'm so skinny. Look at my skinny pecs you know and they're like already you know stuff like that and yeah that's definitely been documented that way but i honestly don't think it's restricted to just fitness and physical mm -hmm. culture i think it's a wider problem with the modern and i'm going to say modern american concept of ambition even though i think this does extend to other countries and cultures right i'm not going to pick on america once but but having lived on three continents and three different cultures right I, i'd say that this is at the very least way way stronger here right this this right. sense that you have to always be be becoming something do you know what i mean like you're, you're constantly focused on what's next and ambition right the worst thing you can be as an american is somebody without ambition <laughs> it's like the american dream is to like, p pursue liberty and happy you have to drive for it you have to get it you know you have to chase it all the time right and people aren't content with just being but whereas in i lived in japan for a couple of years people are more kind of inclined to think about who they are and where they fit and and how do i be a happy teacher how do i be a happy accountant do you know what i mean there's there's more kind of like, okay i'm in this place how am i how do i become good with this right and there's pros and cons to each of those you could argue that you know that approach can be a little passive and it doesn't drive people and economies forward or, you know, whatever your beliefs are on that. But I think there's, there's definitely a kind of an affluenza uh, like, attached to just constantly thinking about what you're going to become, whether it's like a big muscular dude, a popular, good looking dude, you know, a beautiful woman, or even like just a super smart person or a super smart, successful person in terms of business streams and incomes or, you know, property that you have, or whatever it's going to be. If you're constantly focused on this ambition, right. And you have this 20 step plan of how you're going to do it and all these things, if that's all you think about all the time, you never spend any time just being, and you spend most of your time quite deeply unhappy, actually. I think, yeah. you know, you, you, you're, it's reflected in it, like, you know, the life um, satisfaction figures in a lot of countries, like a lot of countries that where they're happy to just be who they are and where they are. They might not have as much, but they're like, yeah, actually, we're good with being Swedish. No, it's no, it's good here. It's good to be Swedish. You know, it's cold as, as all hell and it's blah, blah, blah. But they're all right with it. Whereas in America, like even if people have a quite a good situation and quite a comfortable house and two cars and they have a lot to be grateful for, somehow that gratitude sometimes doesn't seem to translate because well, I don't think it, it's because it, we could say sometimes, you know, that comes from a like a lack of. A, a belief system or a moral code or something like that. Some of that is, but I think also some of it is just driven by this overreaching narrative in society of 
of achieve, achieve, achieve. You know what I mean? Like if you're not ambitious, you're nobody, right? If you're not somebody, you're absolutely nobody. It's like, oh, wait a minute, everybody is somebody and everybody has the right to naturally be and exist. You know? so, so it's that, it's that, it's that measuring stick. Everything's always being measured and compared. Weighed yeah. in the balances, like you've been weighed, you've been measured, you've been found wanting. Like that, mm. and in just an easy example is uh, fitness uh, or strength training. Like I'll, mm. I'll have people, and I'm I I was a huge victim of this. Well, you know, if you can't deadlift three times your body weight, you're not strong. Mm. Which means if you can't deadlift three times your body weight, you're weak. So, <laughs> sure. so yeah. So you end up chasing after these standards that mean it's arbitrary a, goals. It's like, yeah. yeah. And there's yeah. somebody else's standards, and that's the thing. Like one day I realized, like you're being a victim of a slave to somebody else's standards of what they think is strong, and mm. maybe they only think that because that's what they're able to do. <laughs> and yeah. then they and then they put that blanket down for everybody else and what you know like we're sheeps a lot of times and we're like okay that's what i gotta do to be considered strong and you don't even yeah. think about well yeah but so say you can deadlift three times your body weight but you can't walk up and down your stairs yeah who's strong who's strong now right. <laughs> like yeah, it's yeah. this whole you know yeah. weird conundrum right it is definitely yeah so what are what are some of the um what are some of the most interesting kind of concrete experiences that you've had teaching original strength what what are some of the kind of transformations you've seen because in my years of teaching and training systema like i've seen some people you know i've my good friends gene smith and systema instructor i've seen him recover from multiple gunshot wounds and come back to be one of the strongest people i've ever seen you know like deeply structurally strong um more recently i was a systema instructor in toronto and um, one of two spectacular twins the zettler twins you might have seen their stuff online um who trained for many years under vladimir um unfortunately uh, one of them had a, an aneurysm a brain aneurysm and lost the entire use of you know one side of his well one arm inside of his body he lost speech you know side of his face like a stroke um and incredibly through you know dedicated practice over with his brother as well guiding him kind of thing he's he's got himself back to the point where he's walking and speaking and just with a re- incredible recovery rate you know um through yes. systemic principles but things like that impress me more than you know ultimate fighting machines and people who look like they could take on an entire army on their own like these kind of redemptions you know that and you can see kind of the breadth of what this can do to you as a human being what what have you seen in the original strength you must have seen some interesting things along the way so here's the crazy stuff with os um like to me i have seen miracles happen right in front of my face um and so the beautiful thing about our design is is that change can happen in body at the speed of the nervous system Mm. so i have i have shown someone how to press reset um maybe uh maybe how to breathe with their diaphragm or maybe how to move their eyes and their head Mm. and right in front of my face like i had one lady uh she came to a it was a one hour talk i did and she was on a cane um and I, I showed how to, to roll around on the floor and how to rock back and forth on the hands and knees. And after the talk, she came up to me and she said, hey, I came in here using this cane, but I don't need it right now. And I'm going to walk out without it. And she she was in her like mid 60s to 70s, somewhere in there. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Um, and just like that. Right. Her body uh, just it got what it needed. And all yeah. of a sudden she didn't need that cane anymore. I was in, sure. I, I was in Chicago and this, uh, I have a friend named Jim. Uh, he, he was doing, uh, he testing his body weight squat and he could go maybe three quarters of the way down. Um, mm. and within five minutes we did some breathing exercises and he started to test his squat again and he dropped butt the calves into a squat and his pants ripped <laughs> and it went Brrr! like and yeah. everybody heard it and he was he was in his i think it was like 72 73 when this happened and wow. but you know like if you man if you're in your 70s and you're you're thinking well here's my squat but then yeah. but hmm. then five minutes later after getting up off the floor breathing you drop into a deep squat and your pants rip that's life-changing yeah. at the yeah. speed of your nervous system yeah, that is. A, yeah, that often happens. I find when the pathology, you know, the thing that's holding people back, it's it's not actually structural, right? It's their nervous mm-hmm. system holding yes. on to certain patterns of trauma, and you yes. know, maybe they got injured in the past, they fell over, and that part of the body's healed, but it's still protecting itself on the neurological level, right? When you get those instant results, it's almost always because you've reprogrammed that, right? That's the yes. only way. Can if they've got a structural problem, you know, the hip is out of alignment, so that's not going to happen, right? <laughs> They're not oh. starting start something to get up, but it, but it is deeply, deeply rewarding when you see that when you just take the training wheels off of somebody 
and they realize they didn't need them right and then they and they start to open up and and, and move in new ways it's it's phenomenal to see i think but even even with structural issues like say maybe someone has a structural issue because they haven't had a nervous system issue and they had a lot of compensations and then sure. they were yeah. wearing something out structurally and they they yeah. created an adaptation to it orthotics right? in their shoes or something it's like yeah, yeah. so now yeah. we have an adaptation to something that was a compensation and then it becomes structural yeah. or they have a car wreck and mm. they actually have a legitimate, oh, no, that's a structural issue. That's broken. Sure. That doesn't look like it used to anymore. Yeah. But you can still take the nervous system and tap back into its original program and optimize yeah. the yeah. structure that you have, right? Yeah. So yeah. you can still move better. You can still perform better and, yeah. and or hurt less or not hurt at all, yeah. even if you do have those structural issues. And that's really to me is amazing as well. And yeah. like, you're, like you're, uh, the, one, the, the guy that had the aneurysm, Sure. I have a friend, Vicky, uh, last year, well, a year and a half ago, she, she's a triathlete and a coach, you mm. know, trains, trains triathletes. She had a stroke, mm. um, lost her ability to talk, to walk and, and like just her, just her ability to enjoy her life period. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And within the day of getting down on the floor and rolling, her speech mm. started coming back. Wow. That's amazing. And now yeah. within, within, uh, within a few months, she got everything back from wow. just getting on the floor, rolling around, crawling, rocking back and forth. Yeah. It's that neuroplasticity, right? It's that capacity yes. for things to rewire itself. It'd be like, okay, that's broken. Let's go over here. You know, the brain yes. will just literally rewire itself. If, if you know, it, again, there are limits to it sometimes, but, um, but it's, it's amazing when you do see how far it can go, you know, it's, right. it's inspiring to see that. But yeah. even within the limits of the nervous system, mm. miracles are possible. Like, sure. you know, cause mm. that, I mean, somebody has a stroke and they lose function in their body and they might not be thinking they're getting that back. And even if, sure. because just the mental and emotional uh, uh, baggage that or yeah. scars that's going to come from that is the weight of that is yeah. I, 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 something I don't even want to think about. I mean, sure. that could, you know, when you don't feel good and you don't move good, you feel like yeah. you've lost a lot. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, that that for me actually is probably the most important aspect of systema training um, as, a, as a system is that it, it teaches you to know yourself on a deep level and to understand your limitations and to understand where you feel scared or weak so that ahead of time, like before an emergency happens, and this could be a physical emergency, like you have to escape from a burning car or, you know, you know, fight somebody to defend yourself. It could be that, right? And that's partly what it was originally conceived for in, you know, ancient Russia and by people so they could be strong, you know, strong warriors in that sense. Um, but it's also for those emergencies, those, you know, what are you going to be like when you're really ill? If you lose the use of your legs and you have to figure out what, how you're going to get through everyday life, right? Are you going to fold into yourself at that point? Um, you know, and just say, okay, this is my life now and I can't enjoy it because it's not as good as it was. Or do you, are you cultivating that kind of inner thread of resilience that sort of says, okay, even if I lose both arms, even if I lose the ability to walk, um, I might get it back. Even if I don't, I'll be okay. You know, that this, this, this kind of inner core of, true strength right not shell strength um but like the strength that comes from not just a belief in yourself in the sense of like a you know a self-affirmation like looking in the mirror every day and like i'm a, I'm a tiger Rawr. like it's it's not that kind of self-affirmation at all it's actually a, a complete acknowledgement of your own fragility and then an acknowledgement that you know we don't have control over the world and universe and what happens to us some of it is just up to somebody else you know like it just happens um and that if you do that but cultivate kind of this mature cautious optimism you know like it, it doesn't matter i will be fine i can survive anything until i can't and when i can't that's my time and off i go you know like but up until that point there is nothing that i can't survive right that's that's the message that comes through right and that gives you the strength to be resilient for yourself and then for your family and for for people that you want or need to support or protect, you know, and that to me is way more valuable, even than the ability to move, you know, or even than the ability to kind of just calm yourself down in a kind of, you know, neurological sense, that long term, that long game, right? In the short term, you get goals of being able to move better and fight better or breathe better or run better or whatever it's going to be. But actually, the long game is cultivating that resilience. So that when you are 90, that's not gone anymore. Right. And one day your body will break down no matter how, you know, well you try and maintain it. It's it's it will gradually erode. It will gradually break down and we, we're all going to age and we're all going to die. Right. That, that's a given. We're absolutely 100 percent of us are all going to die. Right. Um, but knowing that, accepting it and moving towards that with kind of a resilience, acknowledgement and a joy even 
you know, like rather than be like, oh, I hate the idea that I'll have wrinkles one day and that I might not be able to run as fast as my son or something. You know, you should take joy when your son can beat you in a flat race. You know, you should take joy when somebody can out wrestle you and be like, oh, OK, it's good. It's your time, you know, and, and just kind of walk through life that way. And that's that's become more clear to me in recent events that that's that's actually a, a bigger gift of Sistema training than than just the physical capacities themselves. And it is that right there that draws me to it. Like, mm. and even this is so the first time we got together, you kind of said something towards that vein too. And I'm sure. like, that is absolutely what I'm looking for. Mm. I, and to me, okay, so OS started, I told you, with a Hail Mary prayer, right? Mm. Like, teach me how to be bulletproof, how to be Superman. Yeah. Well, in my experience, since that day, that prayer has never stopped being answered. So mm. in my mind, Systema is just another extension of the, the answer. More things to coming to you along you, the journey. Because you put that out there. But yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and when I saw you move, like it's one thing to watch videos on YouTube. Mm. But when I saw you move, mm. it was literally as if I was watching water or air move. Wow. Okay. And yeah. No, I was going to ask was, you about was, that because I mean, you have a lot of expertise. So, and obviously I'm, you're coming into this from the outside. So it's quite interesting. I, you, you're not seeing it from another martial arts point of view, or even just a nope. pure fitness point of view, you know, you have your ideas about what constitutes natural movement. So see, what did you see? Yeah. I mean, we, we only had an hour together and we worked on just some fairly simple things, but the, what, what was different about the way that I was moving versus other people that you've seen? Well, and, and or even myself, like, so I, again, like it's to trying to, I, I learned, I learned a lot with you. Um, I learned that I need to let go of everything I know, um, because I go in there thinking I can move pretty well. Right. Cause this is what I do. This is all <laughs> sure. I do. Yeah. And, and, and it's all relative. Right. So, and then when I see you move, I'm like, wow, I want to move like that, which for me is like, okay, mm -hmm. now you've shown me something. I don't, you don't have to say anything else. <laughs> <laughs> cool the proof was in the pudding it's like, yeah. <laughs> but, but no like so the the level because i told you what i really was looking forward to was to learn how to truly relax right yeah and you move in such a relaxed manner mm. that there's it, it it was literally watching air and cool and, and you can you know you know it when you know it you see it when you see it right so sure. i mm. i know what beautiful movement looks like and i see it all the time but then there was mm. just something i don't see movement like yours though Hmm. right like i don't see that effortless. you should you should see my teachers man i'll tell you, <laughs> you should so, see my teachers up close yeah they're, they're, yeah incredible you and, see vladimir in person or you see you know at the, it's just um it's difficult to comprehend how somebody can move that way you know it well, just so, seems like they're completely at ease with everything around them all the time you know it's amazing and admittedly when i so i vladimir he, his movement is beautiful but when i watched on youtube i i also thought well this is probably not real i'm looking at i don't know what i'm yeah. looking at because okay but you're right in my face and I'm watching you move and I'm like, <laughs> yeah. okay, this is, yeah. this is definitely something I'm interested in and something I'm looking for. Very cool. Yeah. So that, that was my impression. So nice. dude, yeah, you, you move like a, so a force of nature, right? Water or air, it doesn't matter which they're just, there's just such a flow to it. And it's so relaxed. Yeah. And, that, and that's an interesting thing. And that's, um, I'm looking at the time. I'm like, that's probably an entire another hour of podcast talking about considering the body as a series of kind of, pillars and pulleys which is like the classical kind of kinesiology way of looking at it you know like you have structures and they get pulled around by this versus the tensegrity structure which i know you talk about as well um and the way that it kind of compensates for itself but even beyond that something that we talk about in systema that i don't see a lot in other places is the specific role of like fluid within the fascia like you literally are rolling fluid from one place to another when you move whether you want to or not right whether you're trying to control your movement or make it straight it bits of you know fluid spiral around and slosh around within this big kind of flesh suit that we have right? <laughs> they're going to move around and then the role of breathing in that not just kind of energizing your movement or giving you enough fuel right sufficiency to keep going with the cardiovascular aspect of what you do and cardiovascular is pretty much the only way that most physical things think about breathing right but we think about breathing in a structural way right and a dynamic way and granted in things like weight training you could have things like the valsalva maneuver mm -hmm. you know you pressurize a bit of the baby to, uh, the body to strengthen it on gymnastics you know do the same kind of thing um dance even they'll do that a specific part of the body but in systema there's this idea that you lead movements with breathing and you can actually push um displaced air or fluid into areas of the body in order to initiate a movement and i think it's really this that adds the stability the relaxation or it allows your muscles to relax 
around this kind of hydrostatic st structure, right, um, that you're creating. Because instead of initiating with just pulls of your of your arm, you're initiating actually with a uh, with a displacement of fluid, and then your arm's already in motion. And then once it's past that static in inertia, it's very easy to reach out and make it go far further, right? It's getting over that initial jump from static to moving at all, which typically uses most tension. So if you can avoid that initial static inertia jump, then often your movement just becomes smoother anyway. But it, it can take a long time <laughs> to kind of unlearn the idea that, no, 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 this is my biceps firing, and then that has to chain together with these fascia and this chain, and then that's going to put me up. If you think in those ways, you can achieve a really good quality of movement but it's not going to be the kind of quality of movement that you were talking about in the, you saw in the garage, you know, that right. there are limits to the ways that you can move yourself when you think of yourself as just like biomechanical pulleys and, and levers, you know, it's, um, so that's a really interesting topic. And it's definitely one I'd want to return to with you after you've trained for a few months and, and get your perspective on, you know, how you feel that's augmented or reframed what it is you already know. And that does, you sort of said that, you know, one of the things you learned was that, oh, I have to shelve everything and put it, but that's the really lovely thing about Systema as well. It's like you come to it with your own expertise and knowledge. And maybe for a little while, you have to put that on a shelf, right? While you explore these, and that's a very healthy thing. And it's great that you can do it, right? Some people just, they have that curse of knowledge and they feel like they can't learn anything new, you know, cause they're already so good. But if you can put it on the back burner and then work within the system of Systema for a while, then you can reach behind you and pick it up again. And then it comes, and then, and then you have the benefits of everything you've learned and then a new operating system within which to explore it, you know? So you, it gives you a new context to play with your tools, you know? So one of the coolest things is, all right, all right so in OS, we, we teach, like, so you talked about the Valsava maneuver and, mm. and all the things, like pretension, sure. cog cognitive pretension. Mm. Well, sometimes that's a splint and it can, mm. can jack you up in the long run. Yep. So in OS, we talk about reflexive tension, like your body should just know how to respond and reflect, you know, with, with tension when it needs it, as it needs it. Right. So, yep. mm -hmm. so it's not precognitive, it's reactive or anticipatory. Sure. But what I saw with you is that, okay, I've got, a, I, I have reflexive strength or reflexive tension, mm. but I can actually move with less tension than I'm going, walking around with on a daily basis also. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. I've got, I've got this extra tension in me that I ne don't necessarily need. Yeah. Yeah. Even though I'm, I have reflexive tension, but well, how much of that, you know, can I whittle away the extra stuff that I just yeah. don't need? And I saw that with you and I'm like, oh, so I, I, which was exciting because I'm like, I have something I can learn here. Yeah. And that was, yeah. that was the wonderful part about it. Great. Yeah. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to uh, working with you more um, as we go on Tim, and, um, and, and seeing where you take it and, and what you make of Systema. And, and also I'd love to introduce your materials and your methodology to uh, Systema practitioners. Um, especially I think people coming into Systema at the bottom end, because it can be a little bit intimidating. There's a, there can be a lot of, depending on where you're training and what they emphasize and your instructor, they can emphasize a lot of different things and it can just feel like a fire hose of information like, Oh, you should be doing the breath work every day and you should be rolling around and you should be doing this, you should be doing that. And there's so many, so much to choose from. I really like your methodology in that it can really help create that initial foundation that's so important um, for any physical pursuit and um, Systema being one of them as well. And I think it's just the lovely thing about original strength is that it doesn't conflict in any way. Like most other systems that I've seen, kettlebells or calisthenics or whatever you've got to develop, right? There's always some kind of um, crunch point where you're like, okay, that's useful up to a point. And now this is going against the base principles of Systema, right? It's not natural movement. It's asking you to generate a lot of pretension on purpose, right? And, or whatever it's going to be. And I'm like, this is going to lead me further away from the, the long goal of Systema and what I'm trying to do. But I don't think the original strength does at all. I think it, it marries up perfectly. I think there's a, a beautiful segue from one to the other. So I'd, I'd love to um, tell people in the Systema community more about what you do. Where, where can people find you online if they're looking for your uh, your materials or your website or training workshops or whatever it's going to be? Yeah. So uh, educational materials are on originalstrength.net. Net. And uh, okay. we have a YouTube, the original strength YouTube page, like probably 400 videos <laughs> yeah. of, you know, just free movement. Um, content on how to roll rock crawl stuff like that yeah excellent great so well uh, i'll stick those in the show notes and hopefully people can click through and uh yeah i'm looking forward uh, let's have another conversation a few months down the line it'll be it'll be an Definitely. interesting kind of case study you know sort of see somebody who comes in with lovely movement anyway just like what did you get from this where did you go you know i think i'll be uh, i'm looking forward to seeing uh how you develop and how you enjoy it but thanks so much for taking the time today mate and it's uh, i look forward to seeing you in person again soon thanks for having me this has been awesome thank you to learn more from Glenn, check out ncsystema.com and listen to his podcast, Systema for Life, on your favorite podcast listening platform of choice. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great weekend.